I want to talk a little bit about animals because animals are so important for the Denisov. Uh, in the first place, they're not just animals. We call them animals, but they're animal people. In, in Denisov thought and, and in the, the language, every animal is, is a person. Uh, it is a sentient being. It has its will. It has its own ability to, to judge, its own ability to make decisions. And I've written about this in a number of places, that the difference between a culture that has domestic animals and a culture that is a hunting culture is just enormous. If you have domestic animals, you control their reproduction, you control their death. You, you kill them when you, when you need, you control their breeding. And that ties into the whole Judeo-Christian tradition and into major civilized traditions where sacrifice of one sort or another is, is, is a, a central idea. Christianity, of course, is you know, based upon well, Judaism as well. Uh, Abraham's uh, the, God's command that he sacrifice his, his son and, and uh, Jesus being sacrificed or giving his life to save people. It's, and, and indeed, the, the image of, of the good shepherd. Nobody ever points out in talking about the good shepherd that eventually you eat the sheep. But <laughs> uh, You can tell I'm sort of a lapsed Christian, but <laughs> uh, I want to talk about animals among the Danizah. So first of all, they are animal people. Uh, and the, the earliest stories are about a time when uh, there were giant animals. There weren't the ordinary animals. And part of the creation story is when, when the creator made the world, told it to grow, put the cross on the water, told it to grow. It was only a certain size. He got kind of bored with it after a while. And the, the earth was a certain size. He made a bunch of animals and threw them down. Um, and uh, one of them he made was a wolf. And uh, he sent it out to see how big the world was go around the world, see if it's big enough. Well, it came back pretty soon, and it had a human arm in its mouth. And the creator says, I didn't make that for you to eat. That's, that's, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I'll make you something better. So he, he threw down a moose, uh, and, that's, and, he's, and then he made the world bigger. And, and that animal never came back. Uh, so, you, you know, if you're... Trying to be truly logical, you say, wait a second, that's anachronistic. He hadn't created people yet, and yet there's people. Well, that's the way story, that's the way mythic, mythic intelligence goes. It doesn't matter. As long as something exists, you can place it anywhere you want. So uh, the, now the world is in existence, but there are all these giant animals. Uh, every, every one, in fact, is a, is a giant animal. Everyone he's created is this giant animal. And the only people that he's created haven't figured out how to hunt. Uh, they run away from the, it doesn't really say what they live on, <laughs> but anyway, they, uh, they run away from the giant animals rather than follow them. They don't follow their tracks. The giant animals follow human tracks and catch them and eat them. And so the creator then <coughs> made one man, uh, he called Saya. And in, in Charlie Yahe's creation story, interestingly, he just says, says click a done, one man. He made one man. And of course, everybody who knows the story and the whole psych sequence of stories doesn't have to name him, doesn't have to say Saya. He, in fact, doesn't even name the creator. He just says he, or he, she, and it. In beaver language, it's, it's gender neutral, so it could be he, she, or it. Uh, but uh, so he doesn't name him, but everybody knows it's Saya he who travels around the world, sort of an Apollo figure, you know, traveling around the world, making the seasons. In English, they often call him Santa Claus because uh, when, when solstice time comes around, he gives people lots of presents. And uh, he, he, they said, Saya puts the leaves on the trees in the spring. So same way Santa Claus brings presents to people. <coughs> so Saya is confronted with a world in which giant animals 
are hunting people. And he doesn't know what to do, but he knows that it's sort of his job to do something about it. And so he goes to his old grandma, Asun. And uh, of course, you know, Asun still exists. <coughs> he says, Asun, I'm scared of these. What should I do? And she says, Ashe, grandson, uh, you've got to figure out, you've got to be smarter than they are. Every one of these animals has, has some vulnerability someplace. They're either stupid or they're greedy or they're horny or something. You can figure out something to do <coughs> with each one. And uh, so he goes around the world and there's a, a series of stories for each of these animals. And every one, he figures out what its weakness is, uses its weakness against, against him. They say against the animal. They say he is the first man who followed the tracks rather than being followed by them. And <coughs> so he was the first hunter. And uh, at the end, um, he, he would either, there are two, two things to do. One is he, he would cut the body of the, of the giant animal into little pieces and scatter them out around on the ground. And they would jump up alive still and become the, the smaller versions, the animals, the animal people that we know today. And some of them, he put underneath the earth. He just somehow dug them underneath the earth. And they were so big that uh, the ground just rose over them. So there are all these mounds, uh, the hills and, and even mountains that are created by the giant animals that are underneath the earth. And, but they're still there and their bodies are still there. They're still active in a sense, even though they're still there. And what Charlie Yahe said is, you know what happened with the white people? They figured out there are all, the, all these bodies of giant animals under the earth, and they started drilling down for them because there's lots of grease from the giant animals down there. And they drilled down, and sure enough, they found the grease, and they started pumping it up. They started putting it in their cars, and pretty soon they're going too fast, and they made the world too small. So they went, they went back to the earlier stage of creation when the world was not sufficient. It was a fantastic statement about, you know, the ecological dilemma that we're in now. We've made the world too small for, the, for its existing population. And uh, so Saya was responsible for those two things. Uh, and so, uh, nobody knows exactly what happened to Saya. Um, Johnny Shapizi said he, uh, he went up into the moon. But then he said, but I, I watched the first moon landing and I didn't, they didn't, I didn't see any pictures of him up there. So I don't know, uh, but to this day, every animal is an animal person, and there's a, a, a two, two or three different categories of animals. They're the game animals, um, and for a hunt, uh, a hunter has to go on the on a, a dream trail in the same way that uh, the dreamer goes on a trail of song. Uh, <coughs> he, he probably uses the song of his medicine power to help him on that dream trail, although I'm not exactly sure how that works, because one of the things you can't record, uh, there isn't, isn't a recorder or video recorder that will record dreams yet, so all you can do is, uh, is go on what people tell you about their dreams and about the cultural meaning of dreams. So a hunter will go in his dream and, and uh, find a place where the, the fresh tracks follow the tr fresh tracks, and come to a place where his trail and the trail of the animal intersect, which, again, is, an, is that image of the cross on the water. It's an image of the central, central point of a, cre of a shamanic mythology, of the creation story. The two axes, the above, the below, the, and the main, making seven. That's a you know, classic shamanic sort of cosmology concept. So they, uh, he goes to the place where there's this cross between his trail and the animal's trail. And then he talks to the animal in dream language. Uh, and, and the animal knows who he is. And the animal looks at him and, and thinks, maybe even says, we don't know exactly, uh, are you a good person? Last time you shot an animal, did you share the meat? Did you respect the body? Did you put the bones in a safe place? Uh, were you generous? Were you, were you a good person or were you stingy? Or, or were you disrespectful? Uh, and he knows. Uh, so if, if the hunter has done any of those things, 
the animal goes away and it doesn't happen. If the person has been good, has done the right things, the animal will give himself to the hunter and will know that his spirit will fly up to heaven and then come back down and will come back down in the body of another animal. Um, so then the hunter goes home uh, and whenever the time comes to activate that dream, he goes out hunting and the very last thing he would say was, oh, guess what, I had a dream, uh, get the skillet ready, and there's gonna be meat on the table tonight. No, he wouldn't say anything like that. If he said that, it would go away for sure. So he'll go out on the hunt and they're not always successful. You know, I don't know what the percentage rate is. It's not 100% by any manner of means. And sometimes people go through a long period where, where you know, they're not successful. If that, if that happens, if there is a long period and the person is a, a, a generally good hunter, he will start saying, somebody is using his power against me to cut off that connection between the place that I dreamed about uh, and we have to do something about that. And, and some, sometimes the ac accusation will be sufficiently close to somebody in the band uh, that then the family of that person will say, that guy's been really stingy. That's why he didn't get an animal. And if these things continue going on for very long, that band is going to split. And in fact, I think that's, a, that's an important ecological distribution of population mechanism. Because what, what happens is, if there are too many people trying to hunt in a certain area, yes, your success rate is going to go down. You're over hunting. So if you're over hunting, you're going to start seeing these, these conflicts happening. People are going to start making these accusations against one another, having what I've called a medicine fight. And the reasonable thing to do is instead of killing the other guy is to split. And of course, that's the ecologically most sensible thing to do. You go to another area, you have a dream. Um, the leader of that faction has a dream about where the, the fresh tracks are going to be, where the best place to go is. And you'll go and they'll go their direction. And you'll all come back and be friends again at the summer gathering place where there's enough game for everybody for a short period of time. So anyway, in a normal hunt, uh, you go out and you're successful. You come back with the meat. Uh, sometimes you'll just come back. I've seen it no normally. The, they would not, not try to bring, in the old days, they, they would actually move camp to, to where the kill site was. But when I was there, they were using horses. So <clears throat> the hunter would come back um, with a pannier of uh, meat and everybody, it, he would feed everybody in camp, symbolically important and as well as nutritionally important. Everybody would be fed. And then maybe that night he'd say, funny thing, I had this dream. He wouldn't be too more specific about it, but you know, then he could talk about it. And then the next day, when, when I was there, they, they, they would get together uh, three or four pack horses, couple, you know, pack horses, go out to the kill site, bring the whole thing back, hide and everything, and the women would, would work the hide. So game animals are, are sentient beings that, in which you, you negotiate a relationship. And if you can't negotiate a successful relationship, you're not going to survive as a hunter. So it's a matter of, of using your intelligence and the animal's intelligence and, and dialogue, dialogic, uh, to negotiate a meaningful relationship, a life-sustaining life relationship. Another category of animals uh, that's probably changed quite a bit since the fur trade are the fur-bearing animals. And the b boss of all the fur animals is Wolverine, no way. And no way is a mean son of a bitch, that animal. And they are known that wolverines are notorious that <clears throat> they'll raid a cache. If you've, you've created what you think is a foolproof cache of food or furs or whatever, a wolverine will, will, if he gets into it, he'll eat what he wants and then he'll piss on the rest and, and destroy it. They're really, really mean animals. <laughs> They've just been mean, vindictive animals. But they're the boss. They're the boss of all the fur animals. And... Of course, during the, well, before the fur trade, uh, uh, trapping furs was important for clothing. Uh, uh, that, and I, I'm not sure how much, I think beavers were more important for food as much as anything, because uh, there's a lot of food and they're very fat. They're relatively easy to get. 
They're they're easy to get in the same way that that you can uh, you can uh, schedule your use of those resources. Uh, you you can you can save them. You know that how many beaver are in a particular beaver beaver lodge, and when you need the food, you can go and get a number, the appropriate number, never too many. They just even in fur trade days, they would never over trap in a beaver lodge. They'd always save some. Uh, so I don't know for sure pre-fur trade, but I imagine beaver were more important for food than for pelts, although they certainly were used as sleeping robes and things like that. Uh, the other fur, fur-bearing animals were used as clothes. Uh, rabbits, of course, were really important for uh, for both clothing, they they made rabbit skin blankets. They take the rabbit skins and and wind them up and then then sort of interweave them, and they made really warm warm blankets. Uh, they use rabbit skin for, uh, to line their moccasins in the winter as well. And rabbits are are uh, okay to eat, but you can starve on rabbits only. Uh, so when rabbits are around, they're they're a, they're an important resource. Rabbits, of course, are in a cycle. Uh, a seven-year cycle, and uh, when they're not around, there's hardly any, and, and there's stories about why that's the case. Um, the other fur-bearing animals were were mostly trapped for 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 their uh, furs, and I don't I don't think most of them were even eaten. Lynx were eaten for sure. I know people would eat lynx. Uh, then when the fur trade came, of course, furs became a trade item, important trade item. Beavers probably the most important, the most continuously important. They had no idea what the beaver pelts were used for. They had absolutely no idea that uh, it, it was the felt that was turned into top hats that gentlemen in Europe wore, and hatters used uh, mercury to to uh, create the felt, which gave them mercury poison, and die, they died of as a mad hatter. Um, Anyway, I don't think they knew any about, about that. They just traded the furs, and and it was it was a sort of almost a standard unit of currency. Uh, they would have a fur press, and a certain number of beaver pelts were pressed down in the fur press, and then they'd they'd stack it up against a, a musket, and you'd have to have enough furs, enough beaver pelts to match the the height of the musket in order for a deal to be made. But they also tra- traded all the other furs as well, and. In early 20th century, the other furs were extremely expensive. Very, a lot of those done as all in the 1920s were very wealthy. And, and 1930s, compared, white people were hard scrabble, uh, dirty 30s. Indians were doing really well. You know, they, they were, you know, a fox pelt or a lynx pelt would would sell for two or three hundred dollars in those days. A huge amount of money. Um, so those are kind of two major categories, the, the, the game animals, and, and there are all the others, uh, deer and caribou, uh, and uh, what else, uh, elk, uh, bear. Uh, bear. Bear were important, bear were eaten. Two kinds of bear, black bear and grizzly bear. <coughs> they were both hunted. Um, and uh, there were you know, stories, there's lots of interesting bear stories because bear hibernate, and often they would be taken um, in their dens. If you could identify a bear, a bear den, then you'd have to worry about dealing with the bear. You could just go in and kill it without having to fight it. Um, and other animals uh, are the small ones, the, the insects. Uh, the, uh, the spider I mentioned for Charlie Yahe, uh, Tommy Atachi, uh, in the, the story about, uh, I've alluded to, of, him, him being, he, he was so upset because his, his cousin brother had died and he was just upset by this and he was drinking and he, he threw himself over the railing of the Dog River Bridge and, uh, and then he kind of decided, well, maybe I want to live, but he was, I was having then a hard time, you know, gaining his breath and kept going down and coming up and gasping and everything. And finally he, 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 he thought about his powers and one of the powers was ants. And he said, ants, you think they're small, you think they're powerless and tiny, but there's lots of them. And he said, even a tiny ant 
can go up into the, an orifice of anybody. It can go in their nostril. It can go, go in their ears. It can go in their mouth. It can go up their anus. It can go anywhere. And if, if you want to use your power against somebody, ants are a good way of doing it. You can, they won't even notice until it's hit them. But in this case, uh, he, he saw a branch hanging over the river. And lo and behold, it was covered, swarming with a mass of ants. And he reached out his hand, and the ants pulled him up out of the water and saved his life. And all this story he told me when we were in the King Coin laundromat in Fort St. John watching our clothes going around and around. It was just a bizarre experience. So I, I took immediate notes and then wrote it up as, as, as vividly as I as I as much in storytelling mode as I could, and that's in Trail to Heaven. Um, so uh, animals are still really important. They're, people are, are really upset now about, one, the loss of habitat, and the other, just the, the loss of, of the health of animals because of the oil and gas um, structures around. Uh, most oil and gas wells, all of the oil and gas wells, are not fenced. Uh, and they have around them a whole lot of detritus from, from either from the uh, excavation itself uh, or from the, the operating of the well. And the animals come and, and they're attracted to it because they think it's a salt lick. Their salt licks were traditionally... Oh, that's another thing about animals. Uh, salt licks are places where you can still encounter the, the spirit of a giant animal. You can go to the salt lick, and that's a, a power place, a vision quest place. You can go to a salt lick, and an, an animal, the spirit of a giant animal, can come up and help you, can come up and be your friend. And Charlie Ahe says there's, there's a particular one, it's a really strange-looking albino moose with funny-looking horns, kind of like a cow horn. I don't know what he's talking about, but that's what he said. And... Uh, you can go to a salt lick if you're if you're on a Shinka vision quest, and and that animal may come to you and become your friend. But now, the animals are attracted to the uh, all the chemicals around the oil wells, and uh, they're licking them up, and uh, it's causing terrible illness. They're, they they open the body of one, and there's all kinds of deformities and black spots and weird stuff. And just last year, uh, uh, the Yahes, Gerald Yahe took me up to a place of, uh, up uh, above, uh, they have land at Pink Mountain, a beautiful, beautiful up in the mountains, land that they bought, and uh, Pink Mountain above it, you can drive up to it, and it's above Timberline, beautiful, beautiful place. And believe it or not, right on the top of Pink Mountain, uh, there's a gas well, and it wasn't fenced, and uh, there was all this stuff lying around. And Gerald showed me there were fresh tracks and, and fresh droppings from mountain sheep all around. And he said, they're attracted here. They think it's a lick. They're licking it. It's killing the animals. And that's just that they had the audacity to do that within a couple of miles, within sight of Indian land. They didn't even think. They just, they don't care. Um, Maybe one, another thing I could talk about is the, uh, the ongoing uh, legal challenges that, that the Dunizaw First Nations are making. I know particularly the, the ones having to do with dog and blueberry. Um, a couple of years ago, Chief Marvin Yahe, who's Charlie Yahe's grandson, and quite, a, quite an interesting, powerful person, ex-bull rider, had, he had a whole career as a bull rider on the rodeo circuit, you know, the crazy rodeo circuit, driving from one rodeo to another, sleeping in your cars, you know, riding the stupid bulls, damn near getting killed, but he survived. Anyway, now he's the chief. And uh, he, uh, on, uh, on behalf of, of, of Blueberry and really all of, all of Dunizov First Nations, has launched a suit with the help of, of their lawyers, uh, Ratcliffe and Company, um, <clears throat> a suit against the provincial government um, for issuing licenses for all of the oil and gas infrastructure, all of the seismic roads, all of e everything that's been happening in their traditional territory, um, 
with the argument being that, that uh, Treaty 8 guaranteed them the right to, to hunting, fishing, and trapping and um, with, with only specified use uh, of uh, isolated patches of land for, it didn't specifically say that, but the implication is uh, the Europeans have the right to pr particular areas that they want to use, but overall the land will be preserved for the Danisov for their traditional uses. Well, <clears throat> their argument, which is true, is that that's totally impossible now. The, the extent of the infrastructure, and they've really well documented that, is such that it's just, it's a total, total violation of treaty. So even though uh, the treaty was, was between um, First Nations and the government, the, the federal government, it's the, it's the crown, uh, the BC crown that they're suing because it's the BC crown that has the right to issue all these licenses. But they, they, their argument is that the BC has an obligation to honor treaty rights, the treaty rights dominate Trump, Trump shouldn't use that word, do, dominate uh, the, or over, override the, uh, the, the uh, provincial rights uh, to control land use in their territory. So it's going to be an interesting case. It's been even going to be a long time before it even goes to trial. I guess it'll go to trial in a BC uh, court, uh, and eventually, for sure, it'll end up in the Supreme Court. And um, we don't know what will happen. Um, I may, uh, yeah, almost certainly be asked to be. Well, Jillian and I will be asked to be expert witnesses. Uh, we're having a meeting on Friday, actually, with the lawyers who want us to just give them some background information now on that. As well as there's another case that's a specific claim about uh, the uh, loss of of. Uh, Loss of use of land immediately following their loss of IR-172, and that's, that's a much more specific one. Well, I've been fortunate in, in working for most of my adult life with, with the First Nations community close to home. So it's a lot easier. I can drive there. I can fly there in an hour and a half now. Um, so it's different from a lot of anthropological careers where, where you work in some distant place. It's very hard to get permission, visas, whatever, to, to go back. And often you, you do most of your writing based on what you did for your PhD work. Um, and I suppose what I did for my PhD work uh, has, has resonated through everything else I've done over the years. It's, it's pretty much set the tone for my way of thinking. But at the same time, having that continuity of experience, seeing the done as uh, from uh, no electricity, living more in the bush than in the reserve, no vehicles, um, to running our own businesses and, uh, and instigating important law cases that go to the Supreme Court. Uh, it's a big change. So it's, it's a, it testifies to the value of, of ongoing, continuing ethnographic relationship with, with people. I'm very fortunate that I started when I was 19 years old, really, and uh, I'm 76 now and I'm still going strong. And I think the Danisov appreciate, uh, especially the recordings I made of Charlie Yahe. I know that's, that's the reason that uh, Blueberry invited me up to their cultural days for the last two or three years. Doig invited me to their cultural days this year, and that's when I had the opportunity to, to show the video of, of Charlie Yahe telling the creation story. And uh, <clears throat> probably the, the, the next thing I want, uh, want to do in my legacy is to make sure all of the documentation is, uh, has been preserved digitally, especially there's probably three or 400 hours of video now, and it hasn't been preserved uh, digitally yet. Um, and finally, uh, this is something I've been working on for the last couple of years just for fun. It's a, it's a nonfiction novel about the Duque Sachin family. Uh, I've written several hundred pages of it. And what I've done is taken the stories uh, that I know about Duque Sachin and, and then filled it out uh, with Vision Quest stories that I know from, from other people, um, with Dunizal names, particularly names of women, because I know 
women are tremendously important in this culture, have always been, still are. Um, but unfortunately, in, in the oral history, and a lot of it, some of it, not in the genealogical history, but in a lot of the oral history, uh, the principal characters are named men and their wives are simply listed as wives. Uh, well, what I've done is, uh, because I know how important women are, I've, I've assigned real Danizah names, good, good Danizah names from, from the archive, uh, to the wives of, of the people that, who, who I knew existed back then. And I've, I've written it as a, as a novel in, in a kind of first person. It starts out with me as anthropologist talking, but then the rest of it is, is in first person account by the character about their vision quests, um, the, the, the experience as, as dreamers, the hunts, um, the, just the, the whole story. It's probably going to end, maybe go up as far as uh, Treaty 8 in 1900, but maybe even just end with the first priest. I think that's probably a good way to end it. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with it. Uh, in some ways, I think reading it would be like, like reading a Russian novel or something. There are all these names and relationships in a foreign language. I've, I've created uh, a glossary of terms, and, and I've created a genealogy list of, of all these characters, and I've found that, you know, I've got hundreds of characters now, you know, I've, I've, most of whom I've made up, but most of them actually, you know, existed, even though I don't know any particular, I mean, I know... Duke Sachin's wife, one of his wives, was an important character in one of the stories about him, but I have no name. I also know that, that most of these people, both men and women, married multiple times across generations. <clears throat> and so I've I've been able to 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 have marriages take place across generations. Spouses die, new spouses be recruited and so forth. Uh, so it's a work in progress. I, I, I really don't know what's going to happen with it, whether, whether anybody would want to read it, but uh, it's there. It will be. Anyway, it's going to, going to work on it some more during this winter. Uh, and finally, uh, the Dunnes are doing really well on their own. <laughs> they don't need me. Uh, they do need, uh, it's been really important what I've been able to document. I mean, they really appreciate uh, the amount of information that um, especially the actualities that I've, I've preserved, and they use them all the time. Uh, they have access to them, and uh, they're doing really well. Uh, younger generation is doing 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 well. They're economically they're not really in third world conditions. Uh, they're running businesses. They've got the problems that a lot of First Nations have. There's there's some alcohol and drug abuse. Some places more than less. Uh, there's been some tragic deaths. Um, recently there was a young woman who just died probably of a fentanyl overdose probably just taking some recreational drug that she didn't know any better and and um, you know there's killer drugs out there now that uh, they're pretty vulnerable to that kind of thing I mean people in lower mainland are vulnerable to that and and they're probably even more so so they're, they're they have a lot of tragic events but they also have a tremendous amount of strength, and I'm absolutely confident that they're they're going to continue. And the, there may be a time when their oral history talks about this very strange period when all these white guys started drilling up the grease of the giant animals. The world got too small. Everything went to hell in a handbasket. Got all really crazy. The animals almost all died, and finally they went away. And, and we went back to the stories of the elders, picked up the language again, and um, the animals got healthy, and we continued to be hunters the way we've been for 10,500 years. The, the earliest archaeological evidence in the Peace River area is Charter Lake Cave, which is 10,500 years ago. It's, it's uh, obviously not ancestors of the Danizah language, because we know Athabascan languages came far, from farther north more recently, but no doubt they were ancestors of the actual people, because we know that languages come and, and uh, popula are taken over by populations that intermarry with one another. So I have no doubt that the, the people who were there 10,000 years ago or more 
are, are, are in some real sense ancestors of the people who are here today. Um, they were bison hunters back then. The ecology has, has changed remarkably little actually in that period of time. I've talked to archaeologists and they say it's one of the most stable, continuously occupied areas in North America. Uh, they, were, they were bison hunters. There's evidence, good evidence of that from Charlie Lake Cave, which incidentally is now owned by Doig and Blueberry. They bought the property, uh, so they own it. It's an important site. Um, and now that they don't call it Charlie Lake Cave, they call it Saquon, which means rock house. Um, and it's a testament to the fact that there were still bison in abundance when Alexander Mackenzie came through. He, sa he said, it's like a stall yard. There's so much, so many animals in the Peace River Valley. It's like you're, like there's a stall yard full of, you know, full of animals, bison. So for 10,500 years, they lived with bison in, in a, a, a reasonable equilibrium. They didn't exterminate, they didn't overhunt. Bison were still there within 20 or 30 years of the fur trade, they were commercially extinct. And by the, by the end of the 19th century, they, they, were, they were gone. They've been reintroduced now, so there are, there are some bison in the area. Um, Dunazah is sort of ambivalent about that, because bison are, A, they're really mean animals, and, and B, they, they tend to hang out along the roads and in farmers' fields. Um, but, you know, they also, they also enjoy eating bison meat. Uh, so there's been huge changes, uh, but they're remarkably adaptable people. And I think one way or another, their oral technology is going to stand them in good stead. And I have every confidence that um, generations from now, they'll be able to look back on this as maybe a kind of a strange and aberrant period in their history. Um, but they, they, they will survive, they will endure.